Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about. How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about. Sexual health. How can relationships can evolve relationships with people evolve as they grow and change? Grow and change? The way that we try to make books is that we're actually trying to center young people's experience. So mm. we're less interested in what adults think kids need to know and more interested mm. in what kids want to know. Welcome to the Curious Fox podcast for those challenging the status quo in love, sex, and relationships. My name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Mislow. And today, we're diving into the sex talk, that uncomfortable yet important conversation that we have with kids, often just about the time that their bodies start changing. Now, talking to kids about sex goes beyond the birds and the bees. Well, maybe let's stop saying birds and the bees to start with. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and in fact, conversations about sex often have nothing to do with sex. Mm -hmm. Consent, body autonomy, pleasure, relationships, identity. These are all the building blocks to a healthy, romantic sexual relationship with oneself and with others. And ultimately, a strong sense of self. Although important, let's be honest, these conversations can be awkward for everybody involved. Many of us can remember the uncomfortable sit downs with our parents. Or maybe your sex education came from reductive sex ed at school, magazines, movies, or older friends. The fact that many of us didn't have proper sex education makes it harder to talk about sex with the children in our lives. So how do we tackle this challenge? First, start early, little, often, and in a way that feels age and developmentally appropriate for the child specifically. Start with the basics, learning about body parts, body autonomy, consent, feelings, and relationship skills. Keep the communication channel open and build on what you've already discussed. Second, have good resources that invite curiosity and provide safe conversation starters. We've often talked in the show about the lack of resources that we had growing up and the misinformation that we got as kids. The whitewashed, hetero and mononormative, sometimes elusive information wrapped in euphemisms and innuendos that left us feeling confused and not seen. In episode 127, The Sex Misinformation Crisis, we spoke with journalist Sophia Smith-Galler about the impact that sex misinformation has on us personally and as a society. What we needed as kids were resources that were honest, engaging, accurate, and reflective of different types of bodies and relationships. Guess what, kids? Today, we're talking to someone who has made it their mission to make the sex talk empowering instead of embarrassing. I'm Corey Silverberg. I'm an educator and an author. I make kids' books uh, about gender and sexuality that are also good for adults and families. Along with co-author and illustrator Fiona Smith, Corey is the author of What Makes a Baby, Sex is a Funny Word, and the book that we focused on during our conversation, you know, Sex. In addition to being a parent, educator, and author, Corey is just a lovely human being. Our conversation with them went way beyond the allotted hour, making it hard for us to cut the best parts for this conversation. So if you're a Patreon member, you can listen to the extended version of the episode at We Are Curious Foxes on Patreon. There has been many books and curricula about sex ed for preteens and teens. Knowing what's out there, we started by asking what their guiding principles were while writing their latest book. You know, sex. Well, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I, there's the content, but I guess the the guiding principles, I mean, the first one is just, I didn't want to lie, right? I don't want to say anything that's not true. And so what that means is I'm not very, I'm certainly, there's, there's, nothing, there's no universal statements in this book, right? There just mm -hmm. aren't any, you know, in terms of like, sex is great or sex is a problem or your feelings are this or this is going to look like this. I'm just not aware of any useful, any universal truths in that way, because we all experience stuff differently. All of our bodies and minds are different. And so I really didn't want to say, I just, so much sex education is very well-meaning, 
but you read it and you're just like, you know, and some of it might really click. And then you get to the part where it's just like, that is just not true. And and it's not just that they've said some people, da, da, da. It's that they say, this is the way it is. Puberty is blank or even sex is blank, right? Like, so I don't answer any question with a single answer <laughs> mm-hmm. because I don't mind people saying you left me out. I mean, I do, you know, obviously I don't want to do this, but like people saying like, you left me out of this book or this doesn't fit for me. That makes perfect sense. I really don't want someone to leave the book feeling like I, the author am right. And they are wrong. Cause that, that was my experience a lot as a kid is reading this material and thinking, Oh, there's something wrong with me. Right. And that's the last thing I want anyone to go away with. So that's sort of a, that's sort of a guiding principle or practice, right. That whenever, of course I would write set, I mean, like everyone, I mean, my first draft is terrible and I would write all sorts of sentences full of, <laughs> full of like exaggerated universals. And then I just, it all goes in, in, in the edits. And then the other thing is disability justice. So, I mean, my work is really informed by disability justice. My life is informed by it and being in disability community. So sort of, you know, thinking about ableism and thinking about what disability justice looks like as it applies to every topic. I think those are kind of the biggest sort of guides for me. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. On our Facebook page, we'll make sure to show some some pictures and some video so that folks can get a a sense of actually what the book looks like. But it is, Mm -hmm. when I was looking through it and I I gave it to my daughter to look at, that was actually the first thing that she named was, oh, look Mm -hmm. how inclusive it is. And that was her, you know, to say (laughs) right on the cover, you can see folks with different abilities. You see, what I love also is that you use colors that are blues and reds and greens right. because non non skin colors yeah, yeah. that was yes. something that was yeah. when yeah. i was growing up looking at the textbooks and mm. i was not that color and that's not what my labia right. looked like and that's not what my areola right, looked right, like and right. to your point i then internalized oh there was something wrong with me because that's what it's supposed of to course. look like mm. and there's some gorgeous yes. images of all sorts of rainbow colors of every shape of labia and areola mm-hmm. um, and penis and testes and so so, you know, first gratitude to your point around being able to mm-hmm. have that kind of representation. Can you talk a little bit about that, about where did that come from for you to say, I want to make sure that we, we show all of it? Yeah. And actually, I'll start by saying there's one exception, which is blood, because it was mm-hmm. amazing to me that so, you know, whenever I start a new project, then I go and see, I read all the books that are on the topic. And there's, there's like probably 20 or 30 books that uh, kind of either include something about menstruation or having your period or bleeding, um, or books that are just about that. And even, I guess I wrote this, I started writing this three or four years ago, whenever it was, none of the books used red, even like the really mm-hmm. progressive ones that are like, yes, we love periods. And, and still, it was something that wasn't red, to mm-hmm. say nothing of kind of the brownish red that it often is. Mm-hmm. So Fiona Smith, so my my co-author and illustrator, a lot of her early work was about menstruation and her body and, and bodies in general. And because of that, she brought extra more to this to that chapter. And we were really clear. And I mean, as you have seen, like, it's amazing because the, the chapter is just full of blood, but in a way that I don't think is scary. And I have to say that I have yet to have any young person, now that the book's been out for a few months, say this freaked me out. Mm. The thing with the skin colors is actually, that's just how Fiona has always done people. Mm. So even in her adult art, she really hadn't drawn for young people before. Most of her mm. work is for adults and some of it is quite dark and intense. A lot of it is met around mental health and again, bo- body image and stuff like that. But she just kind of, this this was this was her mode and I mm. like it. And I, I don't know, I really need to ask her what her answer is so I can just give her answer. But my understanding is that her work is both very real in the world and surreal. Like, and we want mm. it to be that, right? So we want mm-hmm. it to be fun and funny. And, you know, the approach to sex ed so often is very biomedical. It's very, mm. it's, like it's a science lesson. That's fine because it, because it is in parts. Mm-hmm. That's kind of all we ever get, particularly mm-hmm. kids, you know, to like the, the worlds that you guys inhabit and, and talk about so much. Like not many people think about starting a sex ed lesson around how we've structured our relationships, right? right. It's like how our baby's made and how mm-hmm. does your body develop? What's the bone develop, you know, and your frontal lobe, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, that's real, but mm-hmm. it's actually not the most relevant thing to a child, to a young person's life, even right. though you can see how it's important. But the way that we try to make books is that we're actually trying to center young people's experience. So mm-hmm. we're less interested in what adults think kids need to know and more interested mm-hmm. in what kids want to know. So to that point, you know, kids are very, obviously they're incredibly astute observers of the world around them. And so when you have a book that just has everyone that kind of looks the same, and then you have your tokenist, like per, tokenistic, like person in a very old fashioned wheelchair and like mm-hmm. one black person, it's not what the world looks like. 
um, mm-hmm. in most places. And even in a place where maybe people do look more the same, young people are noticing the differences. So for us, you know, one of the goals that we said that we kind of gave ourselves or challenges was we wanted the book to look like the world that young people live in. Mm. And luckily we both come from Toronto. Well, I mean, Fiona, you know, Fiona has been a working artist in Toronto forever. I grew up in Toronto and Toronto is this very kind of diverse multicultural city. So it kind of just looks like Toronto. And by mm. making it sort of look like our world, what you find is that that becomes very relatable, right? It doesn't mm. have to be every world. And in fact, when you try to do that, like I'm, I, I, you know, I read a lot of kids' books, so you really get a sense of like, oh, they were trying to be diverse, mm-hmm. right? And and it's a good thing to try, but it doesn't always feel good. It doesn't feel rich. It doesn't feel interesting. Mm-hmm. It sometimes it just feels like an ex- exercise. Yeah, to almost tokenistic, right? You're just kind yeah. of pick one of everything, and then now you're supposed to have diversity, <laughs> but that's just not how, like you said, that's not how the world right. works. Also, yeah. um, I love what you're saying about kids not necessarily being that interested in sex straight away, right? Because they don't see that. Mm-hmm. They they really start with relationships, body, mm-hmm. consent. And then by the, like sex is kind of down the line, but you're right. When we talk about sex ed for kids, we're like starting from, you know, how you make babies. And right. that's just not what their, their head is at. Unless they have like a brother or sister, you know, they have a, a sibling and they've seen the bump and they're like, where right. is the bump? Where did I come from? But until then, they're really more interested in the relating that happens around them, right? Right, yeah, and right. Um, and I love that you, you've you covered that in this book as well. So it's not just, you know, the title is like, you know, sex, but there's a whole section on relationships, including mm-hmm. non-monogamy, right? Mm-hmm. Can you speak to a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, that was certainly one of the most exciting things for me. Like there were some things that I was like, I'm going to get to do in this book because the last book was 79-year-olds. And I mean, the truth is whatever, 79-year-olds also pay attention to relationships mm-hmm. and also live in families where there's monogamy and non-monogamy and polyamory and and non-consensual non-monogamy and and all sorts Mm -hmm. of things. And kids know about that. So the idea that we don't do it with younger kids, it's not exactly accurate. But nonetheless, the previous book, because it was for younger kids, it also had to be shorter. So I didn't get to do it. Mm -hmm. I got to talk about how families are made, but not really relationship structures. So it was just fun to do, right? I mean, it also helps by the fact that my world is full of people who are non-monogamous and, mm-hmm. and less so, but they have some good friends and people in my world who are polyamorous. So so I've already heard these, you know, I've already had these conversations mm-hmm. and, you know, I've had, I've listened to conversations that people have with their kids who are kind of openly poly or non-monogamous. So it actually wasn't so hard. It, mm-hmm. At first it was like, how am I going to do this exactly? And I should say that that's a, that's a chapter that I'm not getting a lot of feedback on. I'm not getting negative, mm-hmm. but it isn't, it isn't the first one people will talk about with me, which I mm-hmm. think, of course, we know that a lot of adults have complicated relationships to their relationships. So I think it, I, I imagine after the book's been out for a year or two, I might start getting, I, I do get a lot of adults coming to me to talk about what they learned in the book and how it, how it helped them. Mm-hmm. I think this is maybe like kind of one of these edge things where people aren't quite ready to talk about it, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask you questions, but mm-hmm. if I am, I'd be curious <laughs> as to what you thought of it. For me and Effie and I were having a conversation earlier, the way I would describe this book almost feels like, and I'm not sure if this was your intention, but like an encyclopedia. Like I can see this as a reference tool. It's on the shelf. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as my daughter or myself or whomever looking through it to say, oh, let me learn more about this thing. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it is that it is included as every other thing. So I want to start from that place that I want to learn more about menstruation. I want to learn more about, you know, breast development. I want to learn more about that. I want to learn about relationship structures. And so then Mm -hmm. that's a resource that I can go to there. And so there's just something straight about like normalizing. I think that that was really helpful. And also, I think the the variety of structures that were offered to them, right? There's like, you know, there's like humorous side of it with the aliens and, and yeah. they kind of say, like, relationships come in all different shapes and sizes. And let me show you all the different, like, you can take it to the moon, literally. You can take it to the moon. Right. Right. And it's and I like that it is, especially on the relationship side, on the, the polyamory side, it's showing normal expected conversation, but just in a different construct, right? So it's, it right. really, I feel like it's, it's really normalizing it and saying, Hey, yeah. like there's all the different ways, different ways that adults make up relationships and, in, and it's all okay. And you might see it this way, you might see it this way and it can go crazy. But ultimately, as long as there's like communication and understanding and, you know, exactly. talking about your needs and, and all that kind of stuff, it's all the same and it's, it's, it's all okay. And I, I appreciated that. I'm glad to hear that because that was, it was the, like the, the sort of challenges when you start thinking about who the audience is. Of course, we know we have some young people who will have parents who are non-monogamous or polyamorous and are, they know about it. And so it's nothing, it's not an unusual thing. It is the way that their families are. Right. And we want those kids to feel that their families can be centered. 
And also we know that for some kids, it'll be absolutely brand new news, Mm -hmm. right? That there are kids who are, depending on the age and where they're growing up, who really have only ever heard of monogamy, right? Right. (laughs) Monogamy or cheating. And so sort of how to do that. The thing that I was kind of happiest about, and it it came in a later draft, was realizing that, so at the end of every chapter, we have questions. And this is sort of to the point of your podcast. Mm -hmm. This is, to me, is the most important part of the book, which is sort of developing curiosity. So Mm -hmm. part of the goal for me of sex education is not that people learn information X or Y, but that people's curiosity is ignited and -hmm. that they know that it's okay to be curious, that curiosity is never bad, right? The way that we we need to ask questions in a way that are boundary and respectful, Mm -hmm. but our internal curiosity is something that can guide us um, and tell us about who we are, right? Mm -hmm. Because what you're curious about says something about who you are. So I loved at at the end of writing that the the chapter and then having those questions, I realized that we could just ask the question, when you think about relationships, do you imagine what kind of relationship you would want? Mm -hmm. Um, Because the thing that was stressing me out a little bit was that because this is for kind of puberty age kids, it did feel, it did feel a little further ahead of where many of them are. Mm -hmm. So except for the kids who are learning, who get to see their families reflected. So that's very important. I'm happy Mm -hmm. that my friends who have kids Mm -hmm. who are polyamorous and non-monogamous now have a book where they're in the book. That feels very good. Mm -hmm. For the rest of the kids, I know that many of them at like nine or 10 are not thinking about relationship structures yet, which is partly why. So for us, I love Effie, what you said about the aliens. For us, part of the reason to do that was to kind of add that element of like, it's, it's in the future. Mm -hmm. So don't, so even like, because again, we don't, we, I never want a kid to think like, oh, am I supposed to know this? Right. Is this something I'm supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. We want to, want to be clear that like we're sharing information and maybe it'll be relevant to you. Maybe it won't. It doesn't need to stress you out. But so this idea that I really love this invitation for kids to imagine the kinds of relationships they want. And again, to the point of like making all relationship structures that are consensual and respectful, giving them equal value. The question is not, do you want to be monogamous or poly- polyamorous, mm-hmm. right? The question is like, what do you want your relationships to look like? And we know this. I mean, I have a lot of teenagers in my life now. And I don't know if you guys do, but you know that like, they're just, they're remaking everything, right? So there's lots of teenagers that, that describe themselves as polyamorous, Mm -hmm. right? Who are dating and may or may not be having any sex, Mm -hmm. but dating in all sorts of configurations that is, that are wild. I mean, I'm 52 years old. So for me, it's (laughs) wild and amazing that they're doing this and they're doing it differently than we're doing it, which is great. Sure. Two things that you mentioned stand out. One is I do think that having to, to your point around planting the seeds early, whether or not now they're in a place of, of thinking about how to design their own relationship, but starting to have conversations that build on each other so mm-hmm. that when it is time to have that, it is not a brand new concept that blows them away. We've already had the conversation established that you can love anyone, that mm-hmm. you can identify as anyone, that you can love mm-hmm. multiple people, that all of those things are possible. And I think right. that's the other thing that I want to note based on, on reading the book and, and this conversation conversation is what I appreciated about that chapter and all of it is it exists without opinion mm-hmm. that, that yes. everything exists as consider this, right? which is a, which is a real value for us here is here's an option. Here's another yeah. option. Your body may look like this, but it may look like that. that yeah. it, it, it just presents itself as this is something that exists that you should know of and you should consider and you should be mm-hmm. curious about, but it has no agenda. And I think that generally, at least speaking about non-monogamy, what we read about it has an agenda on either side and is Absolutely. trying to convince someone uh, you know, one way or another. And so there was just appreciation that this wasn't about convincing. It was mm-hmm. just about acknowledging and representing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I thank you. I, I love that. I haven't heard it described that way, but yes, it doesn't, it doesn't have an opinion. And it's interesting to see how people want it, right? So not not with this book, but but with our very first book, which is called What Makes a Baby, there's a page that has, when it gets to the birth part, it has a vaginal birth and a C-section. And that was important because a lot of people have Mm C-sections and and they have scars and Mm -hmm. they don't always have the opportunity to explain what that scar is to their kid. And so it should be in a book. And people got angry because they said, you shouldn't make C-sections seem equal to natural birth, I'm using quotes, Mm -hmm. because, you know, because the cesarean section is a problem, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And of course, I understand what they're saying. There's some some issues around that for sure. Mm -hmm. But it was just like, well, I'm not, (laughs) like, I don't have, why would I share my opinion about that? You can, you know, and I I say to adults, like parents, like the thing is you can take this, but because there's no opinion, you absolutely could read this book with your child and tell them some things are wrong and mm. use it as an example to you know narrow their options if that's what you're doing as a parent there's mm. nothing that says you can't do that mm-hmm. yeah the other thing i think especially with the non-monogamy piece is that even though kids themselves and their families might be monogamous more and more they're coming across 
family, their friends' families that aren't their mm -hmm. struct, you know, the basic traditional structure. And I think just knowing that those things exist out there, I think also allow kids, even from the most traditional families, to be able to relate to kids with non-monogamous families, polyamorous families, blended families, other structural mm -hmm. families. So it doesn't feel like something is wrong with them, which can, you know, I can imagine it stops bullying, it stops all the things that can happen. At hopefully. Least, <laughs> hopefully, nice. hopefully it, it puts it on the table, which is, of course, it right. should be. I mean, again, and this is the other thing is part of what the book is just doing is it's just like making things like the things that we try to make invisible. I just want to make visible. Right? Yeah. Like we know this, I mean, this, you know, this thing around, I mean, I feel like it is starting to shift, but like having been in these worlds for decades, like I've known forever that so many people are not monogamous and mm. it just feels like still there's this kind of lie about the fact that no, 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 most people are monogamous. Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we were having this conversation around gay families mm -hmm. yesterday, you know, like right. this, this, we've been, you know, yep. the idea of the monogamous, um, heteronormative family is being challenged with the gay marriage and gay families and, mm -hmm. you know, kids with two moms, two dads, two parents. And mm -hmm. I think this is just the next chapter of that, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. look, you, this, there's more to that, you know, the, the families come in whatever size and it just matters that they're a loving unit that, that sticks together and, and kind of welcomes and, and celebrates everyone. And I think this is just like building on that and we should just keep building on it and, and expose people, expose kids as much as we can to what they're going to come across in their lives. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I'm curious to what are the main differences in the way that we talk to adults about sex and relationships and kids? I think we do it badly with adults and we don't do it great with kids either, but I think if we try to do it with kids, so the thing is adults constantly tell me that they're learning stuff from my books. And I think it's because first of all, none of us got the sex education we need or deserve. Mm -hmm. Um, but also most adult sex education is, uh, it's okay. <laughs> it's fine. By that, I mean like something that's set out like a curriculum or something, right? So your podcast is a form of adult sex education. Yes. It's a lot better than most of the curriculum that's out there because it's very, first of all, the stuff for adults always assumes that we know something, mm -hmm. right? And of course, when you're writing for a young person, I don't make that assumption. I don't make the assumption that a young person knows why we wear clothes during the day. I think it's perfectly reasonable for a, a very young person to ask like in my books, as they do in the second book, why do we have to wear clothes anyway? Mm -hmm. Right. And we should start from there. We start around body autonomy uh, from that kind of question. Mm -hmm. So I would say the big difference, I mean, maybe I'll just say this. I don't, for me, there's not a big difference. Mm -hmm. So the way that I talk to young people and the way that I talk to adults, the difference is kind of maybe the density of information, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the three of our books, the first book is 32 pages and it's like, I think, 800 words in total. So it's almost like a poem. It's about where babies come from. The next book was like 149 pages and has a little bit more information. And then this third book is just dense. It's like a graphic novel. There's so much visual information. So it's sort of like how, as people get older, often they have more ways of taking in information and then when they're younger. So I think there's that. Just as you're noting that, I think one of the things that I experience in terms of adult education is it feels like it has an opinion or it's a means yeah. to an end. Yes. I'm oh, going to learn yes. about my genitalia so that I can orgasm or so that right. I can please my partner or so that I can, <laughs> yes. as opposed to just to learn, to learn, to know, to know, to yes. have, to see what the options are available. That I think that's one of the things that as a, for children, it is, let us teach them the bi the biology about yeah. it. And for adults, it's let's teach them how they use their parts in right. order to bring them. <laughs> them, you know, yes, closer is, in their marriage. Yes, and that's that is it. A, <laughs> yes, yeah. That is a much better answer than the one I gave. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and, and so, and so, but I'll, and I'm going to add to it by saying, except a lot of education for kids does have an agenda, which is be monogamous, be heterosexual mm -hmm. and be normal. Right. So don't be queer. And so, so that's, yeah. is it like, don't be trans, don't be non-binary. So my good friend and colleague, Bianca Loriano, and we, who I work with a lot, she talks a lot about adult, adult supremacy. So this idea that in fact, Adults know what they're doing and, and this is the way the world should be. And, the, and our role is to teach kids how to become adults like us, which of course is not a good idea when you look at what we have done with the world, with the planet, with politics, with mm -hmm. violence, with our relationships. Like, like by no measure are we doing well, right? Mm -hmm. Including heteronormativity, right? So if you look at the divorce rates or whatever, whatever you want to look at, rates of domestic violence. So I do think that, that a lot of sex education does have that kind of agenda, the other thing that I experience when I'm working with kids, both in, in the classroom, but also when I'm writing, is expansiveness, is space. It just feels like there's a lot of space. 
So I spent years and years working in like queer sex stores. So that was work with adults. And often I loved that work, but often it was, you know, someone was coming in. The thing I loved about working in sex stores was that it wasn't so much about, it wasn't as much pathologizing. So people didn't come in as much and say like, I have low sexual desire. They would come in and say like, I want to be more turned on. They would talk about what they want. Mm. And so that was really lovely. And usually had like 15 minutes and they had an idea, as you're saying, they have, I want an orgasm or I want to be able to do this to my partner. And when you're starting a conversation with a young person, especially again, when we're talking, you know, our book is, is right around puberty. So the fact is the sexual activities we're discussing are kissing and masturbation, really, right? Because mm-hmm. we're not talking about intercourse. We're not talking about, you know, a, a lot of other kinds of sexual activities at this age. So it does feel more kind of like there's more space mm-hmm. because it is less goal oriented. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I want to pull out something that you were talking about right now too, around there's a distinction between preparing children for the world and preparing them to know themselves deeply for a changing world. Mm -hmm. And that was a shift that I had to make as a parent, that Mm -hmm. so much of what I was doing early in my daughter's life was sit down, be quiet, be still, be this, be that. The messaging that I received, which is you need to be these ways in order to be successful in the world. And what I recognized at some point is that the world that I am preparing her for will not exist when she is older. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing that I can do as a parent is help her know herself so deeply that she can navigate any world that she is in. Right. And so, for example, you know, we, I would love to talk to you a little bit about consent and having that conversation, because that's something that, that hopefully parents are, are talking to their children about. But you talk to it from a place about starting with body autonomy. Like, mm-hmm. let's not start from the place of this is what you should say and right. this is what's going to happen because right. we can't anticipate <laughs> that. But right. let's talk about how it feels in your body when a no is a no. Right. Or when you're right. And so I'm wondering a little bit about that. If you can talk about some of the conversations that parents have with their children that aren't about sex or body mm-hmm. parts, but are about relation and about body autonomy. Yeah. So I mean, I think the, you know, around consent, the thing is that the big thing is like, we don't start by talking about sex, right? So in our consent chapter, first of all, we lay this groundwork. So there's a chapter on body autonomy and, and there's all sorts of stuff about communication and knowing yourself and feeling your body, right? So this is the crux of consent is being able to have a sense of what you actually want as opposed to what you, what you right. think you're supposed to want or what someone else told you to want or what's in the, in the moment. And then being able to communicate that and then being able to be present with another person so you can not only take in the information they're sharing whether they're however however they communicate but so you can hear them and however that means but also you're paying attention to their body because of course we all know how to perform right we know how to perform at the age of 4 or 5 right so this is sort of the problem like i'm sure you've come across like this concept of enthusiastic enthusiastic consent which is not one i use in my work both because it's really ableist because of course we all show enthusiasm in a different way and also all of us know how to pretend enthusiasm right mm-hmm. so so what you're doing is you're tuning into your own body, what you want in your mind in a, in a moment. You're also having to tune into someone else's body and mind and listen, like with your, we call it whole body listening. So don't just listen to the words they're saying, but listen, do you know, do you know what this person looks like when they're uncomfortable or uncertain? And so it's very complicated, right? So unfortunately, so consent isn't simple. So we shouldn't start in sex situations because, you know, by the time, so our, you know, I, I think if the consent chapter is about 20 pages, the first 10 pages have nothing to do with a sexual situation. And then there's a spin the bottle game. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that we add there, of course, is like on top of all of this, imagine feeling sexy, being, you know, we don't use the word aroused, but for adults, I'd say like, imagine when you're feeling aroused, which is a whole body feeling it's in, in our minds are in our bodies. How does that impact our choices? Mm-hmm. You know, the scene starts with a classroom and one kid says, and, you know, Cooper asks Mimi if he can borrow a pen and she pauses for a second and then she says, yeah, here's a pen. And the teacher says like, that was just consent, right? Because mm-hmm. someone asked, you asked for something you wanted and needed, you thought about it, you made a decision and then you acted on that decision. Mm-hmm. So that's one piece of it is like just looking for the consent in everyday life. Now, mm-hmm. the complicated thing for parents is that most of the examples with our younger children are examples of non-consent right? So Mm -hmm. they don't get to decide, you know, at the early stage, they don't get to decide whether to wear a diaper or not, or what kind of diaper, like we're making that decision. We're deciding what clothes they're going to wear. As they get older, we're deciding if they're going to go to school and where, but also Mm -hmm. where they're going to live, right? If we have to move for a job, most of us don't ask our kids if it's okay with them. And we don't, because we can't. So Mm -hmm. our kids' lives are full of non-consensual experiences. 
I think the thing that we should do is start naming them, right? I think the first thing before thinking like, how do I have these complicated conversations? The first thing I would say to parents, and I, I do say to parents, is just start pointing out where consent is and where mm-hmm. it isn't. Um, and name it. And I say that I do that with my kid all the time. I say, I know it's not, uh, you know, you don't have a choice here. And that sucks. It's not fair, which is the language, the language my kid mm-hmm. uses. So you're right about that. And this is the way it is. And and of course, I also share that as you get older, you're going to have more, you know, more access to your body autonomy. You're going to have more access to choices. But it's also finding the choice, finding power in that constraint, mm-hmm. right? So giving kids like, yes, you can't decide if you're going to go to school or not. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, what can you decide? Right. And so, you know, you know, some parents like, but you know, you can like basically take mental health days, right. If you need a day off and I can manage it, then I'm going to let you do that. Cause I know that school's not your thing or whatever the example mm-hmm. is. So, so for me, that's, that's actually, you know, the important thing. Cause the other thing is, you know, in terms of sort of setting our kids up to experience sexual violence and victimization mm-hmm. is we're teaching them to ignore their bodies. Right. Particularly in school. Like, and I love teachers, and also, I do not like school as a structure. Mm-hmm. It's not about the teachers or the people who run the schools necessarily. But, you know, what happens in classrooms all the time is, you know, you have like 20 or 30 kids. Kids are having feelings, including like some kids might just be crying. They're having a hard day. And everyone is told to stay in their seat, mm-hmm. right? So you're literally being taught to ignore the feelings of people you have a relationship with, whether it's a good one or not. You are connected to them because you're in this classroom five days a week. Mm-hmm. And you're also taught to ignore the, whatever is happening for you. Like, right. So it's like, when I see someone who I think is in pain, I, you know, if you're on the subway, classic example, I used to live in New York. So you're on the subway, you see someone crying. You're just not sure. Like, should you intrude? Should you not intrude? You want to make sure that they know that there's someone is noticing them. It's stressful for me. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you figure it out. You, you just always walk around with Kleenex and so you can just offer a Kleenex or what mm-hmm. you figure your way out. Mm-hmm. But but our kids are, are, are being told not to reach out to other people and also to, to ignore those signals, mm-hmm. to ignore their instincts. And that is not good, right? And then they're teenagers and the ones who choose to explore sex are exploring sex and they're not very good at like dealing with consent. And it's like no surprise because, because the, we don't give them a lot of opportunity yeah. to practice. Yeah. I don't have any kids. So Jackie's mm-hmm. got, uh, you know, hands-on experience. I just have like book, you know, book knowledge. But one of the things that... <laughs> well, I'm sure that's not 100% true. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm surrounded by... Yes, you know, I'm different. I'm surrounded by kids and I do actually. I'm, I'm like the I'm like the aunt to, to all the kids right. and, they, and they love me. And because they get their questions answered, like I'm the one mm-hmm. they come to because they know they can ask anything and they'll get an mm-hmm. answer. Um, right. So that I am that person. And one of the things is, is that... I have to explain is that for us as well, for adults to know that a human infant is born 100% dependent with zero boundaries. Mm -hmm, And then mm -hmm. that needs to shift (laughs) throughout the developmental years, right? We learn, we get to have boundaries and we get to have them in an age appropriate way. We get to become independent on our way to becoming interdependent. And it's a Mm -hmm. process, right? And I I mean, Mm -hmm. I I actually love your books. I I found you through your books. I have um, a stack of books that I give to all my friends when they have kids. And it's like age appropriate sex ed and relationship ed. They like, just, you know, when the time is right, pull the book, you're going to have what you need. And your, Mm -hmm. your books are in that stack. And I love Mm -hmm. that you cover, you cover the full range of that, you know, because it is a process. You can't Mm -hmm. dump it all and you can't ignore it. You can't do too much too soon or leave it too late. And then now you're dealing with a mess and and try to undo a bunch of things. And I Mm -hmm. think just realizing that it is a process. And I, is one of the things that I, I love about your book, that it honors the process. Mm-hmm. And it never stops, right? Like, the, I mean, the thing I think I like, like love about what you guys do and talk about is that it's such a good, I mean, the relationship stuff, because adults don't want to always talk. And it's not always appropriate to be talking about sex. The topic of sex and sexual activities is not the one that you share necessarily with young people. Right. So relationship structure uh, mm-hmm. is, right? And I think it's such a perfect, like, I think, again, one of the lies that I think we tell kids over and over is that adults have it all figured out. Right. Mm-hmm. And of course we don't, particularly around relationships. Mm-hmm. So getting to see adults who are talking through how should our relationships be and being open about the fact that like this thing that I was offered uh, as a young person does not work for me mm-hmm. and I can actually do something different. I think it's like, it's the modeling that young people deserve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
in the spirit of, of normalizing experiences too, as a parent, I want to name, it can be very uncomfortable to watch your child practice consent. That is the thing <laughs> you want them to do. But when you are the recipient of the no, that's really oh, challenging. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. And so there's, there's two examples of things that I started to do with my daughter when she was young. One was tickle game. So I would mm-hmm. tickle her and she would say at any point, she would say, stop. And immediately my hands had to, to move off of her. And right, that was right. a part of the game. Cause then she would Perfect. be tickled by that and say, go. And then we would tickle again and she would say, stop. And, and so that started really early on of, I'm going to teach you that when you say no, that means even for me, I stop touching Mm -hmm. you. That's what Mm -hmm. that looks like. And the other was, and this was actually much more difficult was not forcing her to hug relatives or to kiss yeah. relatives mm-hmm. and to be, and to give her other options and say, okay, well you can do high five or you can do virtual. And then having conversations with the grownups to say, I know that yeah. you want to smother them. And I know, I know. And this is why I'm teaching them that. And so the, the, you know, there were many conversations there, but there are oftentimes now I just want to kiss her and hug her. I know, I know. And she says, she <laughs> said, and she'll say to me, you do not have consent. And right. I'm like, damn, my <laughs> education. I know. I am teaching happened. you about boundaries <laughs> that just happened to me last night it is so hard because you sometimes just want to like yeah. like consume your child because they're yeah. so beautiful to you and then they say no and you're like okay and i mean i think i also want but let me let me throw in another one i'd be interested in how you deal with this because this is this is for me a complicated edge is so for example we'll be out together in public just walking down the street and i'll start singing or i have a song stuck in my head because of them so i have k-pop stuck in my head mm-hmm. and i start singing it and they say no stop right and they well, have me stop because they're embarrassed Mm-hmm. And there have been times when I don't stop. And then someone has pointed out, well, wait, they said stop. So I don't know what to do about that because I feel mm-hmm. like it's about where consent begins and ends around our bodies, right? It's like, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. It is not right for me just to go up and hug them, even though it's a beautiful thing. And of course, sometimes, sometimes it happens. Like, like <laughs> when I go to wake them up in the morning and I wake them up by kissing them on the forehead, I don't say, can right. I kiss you on the forehead? I do it. <laughs> and usually they're fine with that. <laughs> but true. like you, I mean, I really have done that time where it's like, can I go in for a hug? And they'll be like, no. But then there's this other t- these other times, mm-hmm. which then are, is confusing because they're the one that bring up, they said, I said no. Mm-hmm. And I've had, to, and I, I'm still thinking through like, how do I, dis- how do I explain to them? Well, this no is different because mm-hmm. I we're out in public and I'm not, I'm not actually touching you or making you do anything. Um, what we got to was like, um, if you don't like this, you can walk ahead. Have you had any of those kinds of moments where oh, you're like, all the time. wait yes. a second, I'm, not, I'm not like gonna listen to that now. Any of the things. Right. No, particularly the songs that she's interested. I should not right. then also be interested right. in those Exactly. Songs. No, that's <laughs> wildly embarrassing. If I but it's also embarrassing if I'm listening to music that she doesn't listen to because that's old fashioned music. Um right. yeah, for me I think it and, and it is exactly what you're describing. I think each time is different and it's about conversation. I think what was important to me at some point was I wanted to teach her about differentiation and that I too am an independent person with choices. And sometimes my choices about my body aren't going to be the things that she wants, my choices about my relationships, and that we'll have dialogue about them, but that I am not going to shift what I'm doing all the time to make her feel comfortable. And so there, my daughter in particular has sound sensitivity. And so sometimes I'll be singing low and she'll say like the, like she'll like tighten up and say like the whispering is bothering me. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That's about Mm -hmm. like, there's something happening in your body there and I'm going to adjust now. But if I'm joyfully singing a song as I'm cooking and she's embarrassed by that, often my case is, my, my statement is you, just let me be me. You right. can go be you in a different space. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. That's, I'm going to sing yeah. this song because it brings me joy. If it doesn't bring you joy to see me joyful, if there's no compersion here, that's right. okay. There are other spaces <laughs> where you can find joy. Right, yeah. find joy elsewhere. Um, that's great. I really appreciate that other example around, around sound sensitivity because that's right. Because I did have a moment of like, oh, wait. And I think, you know, what I got stuck in there was like this, this very kind of black and white thinking of Mm-hmm. about yes and no, which again is how consent is often mm-hmm. taught, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Every no isn't the same kind of no. Now this was, and this was a big challenge in, the, in, in our book because it is a book for, you know, 10, 11, or even eight, nine, 10 year olds. You know, there's a lot of concrete thinkers. So you don't want to say, I never said something like, well, every no, you know, there's no, there's many kinds of no's because it's like that, yeah. you know, to your point about adults, like that is something, you know, I feel a certain responsibility when writing for young people to do a lot of protection around, around violence. But we know as adults, as you just said, like, so then, you know, no, stop singing 
mm-hmm. is I, I said, no, that's not the same as I, cause I'm embarrassed versus cause it's actually hurting my body. Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah, actually I'm going to, I'm going to use that and share your <laughs> example because I think it's very good. It's very concrete. Yeah. 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 Also, I think there is something around the, I agree with you that enthusiastic consent is not ideal, right? Because sometimes you're not enthusiastic. You are curious Mm-hmm. And you don't know if you if you want something or not because you've never experienced it, right? So right, at some right. point you're gonna have to try it. So how do you negotiate a maybe? How do you negotiate? Okay, can mm-hmm. we break this down? Like I want to have a go. Am I sure and enthusiastic? Not really. Am I curious? Right. Hell yeah, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you allow for curiosity? How do you allow for flexibility? How do you allow for changing your mind? How do you allow for experiences that you're not sure but you want to find out about, right? So it is it gets. The binary, the enthusiastic yes or hell no dissolves really quickly when you're dealing Mm -hmm. with real life stuff, especially Mm -hmm. for youth who just don't know. Like they Mm -hmm. just don't know. Exactly. It's not the way that to consent is taught doesn't work. It like doesn't almost doesn't apply to people who haven't tried things yet, right? So how do right. you know if you're going to want to kiss someone? Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. I get. I mean, it's it's where Mm -hmm. we're doing a, a disservice because we're not making it real life. Yeah. And as a parent, again, I, I think I'm glad, so glad we're talking about this. At every moment, if you're a conscious parent, there are forks in the roads everywhere. Mm-hmm. And my, I'm constantly, so for, for the example that, that came to mind, Effie, as you were sharing that is with food, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to, I don't want that because that mm-hmm. doesn't taste good. And I'm like, well, you haven't tried it yet. So you don't know whether or not it tastes good. And it's like, well, I want the standard, right? I want the, I want pizza or chicken nuggets or mac and cheese or hamburger. Like, give me the standard. I don't want any of that. And in that moment, there's a one side of me is saying, well, her body is telling her what she wants. I need to honor that. The other side of me is saying, well, but it's my job and responsibility to expose her to different things, Mm -hmm. right? She can't just have ice cream because that's what her body wants. She needs to have protein. And so like, there's this battle that's happening live and in that moment. And every time the strategy will change. And so, you know, at some point when she was younger, there was a, a, a rule or an invitation that she had to put something in her mouth, try it, chew it a few times, right. and she could spit it out if she wanted to, but at least try the thing or take the bite of the thing once and then you can make a decision after that. Or or I'm going to cook this meal. If that's not the thing that you want, you're now old enough to prepare your own meal. So right. this is the thing I made. You can go figure something else out. But there is no one answer to it. it mm-hmm. and, and if you're standing there in the midst of a moment and feel conflict, that is normal. <laughs> and you were all doing the best we can. Well, that's the thing. And, and, but it's hard to act. Like, I just don't know. I never know what to do. Yeah. Yeah, We have this like, no, thank you helping. Um, like you have to have a no, thank you helping, which is just try it. But that's also such a good example. And of course it's also happening when we're busy and tired. And so we're not in the best position to be like, how can I maximize this as an educational moment? Yes. yes. (laughs) And we're not talking right now about sex per se. No, we are talking about, this is all a part of the conversation. It is all the building blocks to that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is about bodies, right? I mean, that's the thing is like, it's very connected. It's like you're, she is making a decision. She's telling you something about her body. You are responding Mm -hmm. and you're also responding with a bigger context, which is you happen to know, like, it's so funny with kids though, because of course, like you may have a sense like they're going to love this new food because it's so salty and they love salty foods. But of course, if you present it as something they're going to love, then they're probably not going to love it. And so, (laughs) so it's very complicated. It's also interesting because they all have different reactions to different people, right? Sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, because like we were saying, I'm, I am the cool adult that they get to ask questions and they, they want to share what they're listening to and they want to know what I'm doing and they want to try the things I'm doing. And it could be, it's often exactly what their mom is saying. Mm-hmm. Right. But, but because it's coming from me and not mom, right. it's suddenly excited and interesting and, and all the things, and they're much more willing to try. So it also depends who you're dealing with. Right. I mean, it speaks to the failure in my opinion of like sort of sort of traditional monogamy, but also heteronormativity around families. Like, it does not, parents are not able to do all this education. We don't do our kids a service if we think that we're going to be the ones to teach them everything. So my friend and colleague who I mentioned, Bianca Loriano, is also child, she's child-free by choice. She's the trusted adult to many kids, including mine. And the stuff that she can do with kids and the stuff that you can do with kids is so necessary and it's so different. Yeah. Question about age appropriate conversations with kids right. and my and my personal struggle, I think, with that. So Effie has known me for several years and has seen my my daughter grow up. And, and there are times where she has shared with me that I have the ability, my background is, is in many things, youth development, education being two of them. I can turn anything into a gamer story, 
Right. right? That's great. And so <laughs> the the delivery was age appropriate, but there were times that Effie was like, that content feels a little heavy for an eight-year-old. <laughs> I appreciate that it, you use construction paper and that you did a dance <laughs> to go along with it, but that feels like a lot of context for an eight-year-old, right? And so that was an important conversation for me because it helped me partial out the distinction between, can I say it in a way that a child understands? Mm -hmm. And is this the conversation that I should be having with this child right now, right? So those were two different things. Things. Right. But what what I have heard people say is, well, wait for wait for children to ask. I think that 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 can be smart. I, my my experience is that my daughter is asking questions that she is curious about based on what she's seeing on TV mm -hmm. or hearing, mm -hmm. not net, but more from a place of I heard this word. What does this mean? Not mm -hmm. I'm ready to understand this concept and how it applies to me. Right. And so, like parceling out that is also something that I'm thinking about. And then you know, my strategy has been to try to share things out side of context, meaning we're not going to sit down now and have the conversation, but in some normal outside conversation, I will mm -hmm. reference something or plant some seed that I can build right. on later. But that is something that I, that I struggle with is how do I know what is age appropriate? How do you know when the yeah. time is? And so I'm interested in your thoughts. Well, I really love how you just shared all that because 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 the, the term age appropriate is such a sort of a trigger. It's not trigger is the wrong word, but it's so like it's gatekeeping, right? Because because mm -hmm. because what like age appropriate according to who and for who, right? right. And it doesn't consider developmental de de developmental Difference. growth exactly. Right. Developmental right. differences versus age. Yeah, growth. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, but I just want to say that it's the way that you just shared that was beautiful because you didn't, you didn't go in, in that direction, you know, because, because I think that what we're taught, what you're talking about is like, so what's best for your kid or for a kid? I mean, would it, can I ask you? And I do just say, no, it's too, like the, the time when Effie called this out, mm -hmm. like, what was the topic? Was it, was it related to like, like violence or war or was it a sex, you know, a relationships question. or sex or something? My guess would be that it would be around um, relationships, right, with, with mm -hmm. your partner coming into coming into your lives and how to mm -hmm. how to approach that and how right. much does she need to know. And I think right. I, I imagine right. it's probably around that conversation more than yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I guess my I mean, listen, as you already said, there's no right answer, and and I and I'll also say because I say this any chance I get, like the last thing parents need to be told is they're doing it wrong. So mm -hmm. I don't think anyone that we're doing our best. And I personally err more on the side of you, Jacqueline, in that in that I think that kids are treated like they're such idiots by so many adults that, that, that for those of us who are, the other thing is it's a skill, right? So it's a skill to be able to explain capitalism to an eight-year-old, or for that matter, non-monogamy or polyamory, or desire, or hate, or, I mean, or war. I mean, all of these things, they are very complicated stuff. And for adults that aren't comfortable doing it or don't quite know how, I don't think they need to, They're, you know, but those of us who can turn anything into a construction paper project, I think you go, go there. Because the other, like, let me say this, which is something I learned from a children's librarian, kids are their own best censors. And she was talking about books in, the, in, in that if a kid picks up a book and it's too much for them, or it's over their head, they just put it down. They, they don't they don't try to get a band and they don't get offended they just stop reading it and with my books it's so clear like to, it's so clear to me because I have so I have an eight year old and you know so they have friends and but I have kids in my life of all different ages and I've seen this over and over where a parent will say like let's sit down and read Corey's second book which is sort of a seven to nine year olds and the kid is bored and and not interested and six months later they can't put it down because they're just mm -hmm. in a different place six months later. So I do want to say that like, if you're paying attention to your kid, like you already, I don't know if you use the term engaged parenting, but anyway, obviously you're an engaged parent. Mm -hmm. If you're paying attention to your kid, they're going to let you know on some level if like, okay. I mean, often what happens with parents like you and like me who want to want to do this they're like, okay, that's enough. I've, I've heard enough. Right. Cause I just, I'm like, I just listened to a podcast and I learned this thing. Now right. everyone around me must also learn this thing. <laughs> right. Immediately. Right. Come to and our lives. Yes. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. But you know, and the truth is that like our friends might not be honest with us. Our friends might sit with us for another 20 minutes and let you go on, but you know, your kid is not going to do that. So they're getting something from it. And also it's, it's very possible that they're totally tuned out. And so they're not being harmed by it. For me, I'll just share, like, so I don't have an answer here, but I'll share like my struggle is it's about, it is about kind of like how much I should expect my kid to show up for kind of processing in a way. Like, yeah. like when I don't have an agenda, when it isn't about like, okay, you know, we are going to visit, so like to visit family and let's talk about how we're going to deal with the grandparents who want to hug and kiss you. Yeah. Um, and we support you in making your choice. So that's, that's like a, that's like a sit down thing. We're going to decide this, this, but when it's not that, and it's more like, I, there's something that I'm wondering about or I'm curious about. 
And I do wonder, like, to sort of speak to what like Effie was sharing with you, like maybe it's just too much for them. Because the thing is, we also know that our kids uh, don't, you know, our kids take stuff on, right? The kids take responsibility for us in ways that we know is not good, but it's almost inevitable. I've never seen a family dynamic where that doesn't happen, right? Where the kid has some sense that their parents' mood, et cetera, is, it's dependent on them. So we know that kids can take stuff on and not share with us the burden of that. And the other thing is, I think that we can also go back to our kids, like if like, you know, go back the next day and say like, mm, how did that feel? Right. Did it feel mm-hmm. like too much? And like, and like give them a bunch of, I mean, your kid's a bit older, like, and you know, for younger kids, it's like give them some options about like that feel boring or weird, mm-hmm. or are you tired of me bringing stuff to you? <laughs> right. And also like, mm-hmm. what do you, like, I have to ask my kid cause I'm so overly enthusiastic about things, about learning. Like I tell them like, so tell me what, what do you, how can you slow me? Like if I want to talk to you about something and you're not interested, because mm-hmm. the thing, the other thing that happens is sometimes my feelings get hurt, mm-hmm. right? Which I don't tell them, but mm-hmm. it happens. And so I'm trying to like, you know, like, oh, they don't want to learn about this. Yeah. I took all this time to create this construction paper. World. <laughs> exactly. And now you're saying you don't want to learn about <laughs> it. Look what I did with the other paper rolls. But I think, but I also just, I think the thing I'll say, you know, that I found with our book is I have never seen a kid be really harmed by a conversation, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that kids can be harmed by images they see, particularly mm-hmm. photographs more than kind of mm-hmm. drawings and things they hear, you know, and things they witness. Mm-hmm. But I'm not really sure it's harmful. I think it might, I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's also, the, I guess the other big question is like, how anxious is your kid, right? So mm-hmm. many of our kids are more anxious than they were before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And so for people who have, I, w- I was just doing this talk for parents and one of the parents asked this question and then their second part was like, and how do I deal with that with a severely anxious kid? And I was like, mm-hmm. as someone who has a lot of anxiety, it like really melted me. But yeah, so that's the other thing. So you have a sense of like how much your kid can handle mm-hmm. Also, I think I mean, it changes from kid to kid, right? Jackie's kid is very vocal. And even I think when... No wonder. You know, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> right. How did that happen? Right. Um, and I think she and, she... and she's not some... You know, she's not afraid to say the, the unpleasant thing. You know, like she, she, mm-hmm. she did look at your book. So Jackie did give your book. And she did have a look. And she said, yeah, some parts of it made me feel awkward. You know, she was like... Mm. I don't, I'm not ready to look at genitalia. Uh-huh. And she was able to sort of say, that part isn't for me, right? And I think there's a kid who can do that and there's a kid who can't do that, right? right and I think right. you just need to know your kid, yeah, know thyself and know your kid, I guess. Right, mm-hmm. right. So we have gotten to know ourselves better through your book and are interested in getting to know you better with some four, with four questions that we have to end our conversation <laughs> okay. with you. And we ask this first question to everyone, but frankly, I think that you are the best person to ask this question, which is, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self about love, sex, or relationships? So I think the advice would be, like, would be to know that you can have intimacy without sex and you can have sex without intimacy. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that even though I was raised by a sex therapist with a lot of this, I did not know that. And many years of my adult, like early adult life, many, many, like in my twenties, my life would have been different and a lot better if I had understood that. Beautiful. Love that. That's so good. That's so good. Um, Okay. What is one romantic or sexual adventure on your bucket list? Yeah, I don't have, (laughs) I don't have one. (laughs) I mean, what, like, cause my bucket list would be like, all my friends have housing and we get to live near each other as we're mm-hmm. when when we're when we're when we're when we're near the end of our lives. That, 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 that would be that would be that's mine. Nice. Yeah, that's nice. Love that. This feels self evident, but I'll ask the question anyway. How do you challenge the status quo? You know, difficultly, I will say, right? Even though it's my job, it still feels like I still feel uncomfortable when I know that some people don't like what I do. So how do I do it? I mean, I do it, I guess my experience, I do it by just trying to be as much of myself as I can, right? So Mm -hmm. to actually be honest, right? Which is always hard because Mm -hmm. I know that I'm weird, like I'm queer and that's just another way of saying I'm I'm weird. And so sharing the ways that we're weird is really helpful as it turns out Mm -hmm. because it helps Mm -hmm. other people, you know, talk about how they're weird too. Best answers that I've heard to that. That's (laughs) that's great. I love that. That's funny. Last but not least, we are a curious bunch around here and we are curious mm-hmm. about what you're curious about lately. I am curious about where human people fit into the incredible kind of divisiveness in, I guess, the United States. So I, right now I'm living in Canada, but um, it's all North America. You know, people are so mean to each other and are being so violent to each other. And mm-hmm. so we know that there are people who are violent and, and also we know that lots and lots of people are not, right? Mm-hmm. 
And yet they're making choices, like including here, this is not actually about, to be very clear, it's not like the only bad things happening in the United States. People make choices through who they vote for and the mm-hmm. kinds of language they use. And I, I guess I am genuinely curious about like, so I guess I'm just curious about that in that like, it's hard for me to imagine, it's not hard for me to imagine a small group of white supremacists making a lot of noise. Like, so I know that's how book banning works, that it isn't the majority of people or parents, but then you can, because it's so overwhelming, you can start, you start thinking like, oh my God, there's so many people who are just being so hurtful and wanting to control other people. And so I guess, yeah, I mean, I have curiosity about that. I guess I have, you know, curiosity about like how... How do we get somewhere else, right? How do we move mm. towards liberation? And maybe the answer is just like, there's going to be like things, I mean, things are going to keep getting worse and worse and then it'll get better. But yeah, so I guess I, like, so I have a lot of friends who are abolitionists who are teaching me. And so I'm ha- I have this, and because I'm queer, like I have a real interest in imagining a f- different future. And I am curious about how we get there, right? And I think it has to do partly with my age, like I'm 52. So I don't have that, you know, I have hopefully some years left, but it's not like I'm 20. So yeah, I'm curious about that. And then, you know, the other thing I'm going to say is I'm actually now just very curious about both of you. And I'm going to share that because having this book come out, I do a lot of interviews, which I don't like mostly because it's just people asking me questions and I'm genuinely very curious about people. And, and, you know, so I got to be on fresh air with this uh, host who was, she was amazing. It wasn't the regular host and she was great. And she was very like warm and generous with her questions but it's like, she was all business as she should be. It's like this, you know, national show. So then you just get off and it's like, I don't know anything about her. <laughs> and it's also not appropriate. Like I'm not going to email her and say, like, now can I ask you questions? Cause like it's her job. So mm-hmm. anyway, so because you asked, I'm just going to say like, this is, this is the problem with these things. Cause like I have a hundred questions for both of you, but, mm-hmm. but it's now 11, you know, it's, it's time. So <laughs> it's time. Well, come, please come back. Yeah. Okay. Right. And also official invitation to have conversation that is not recorded. I'm just okay. happy yes. to be in dialogue with you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay, okay, that's right. It doesn't yeah. have to be recorded. Excellent. No, okay, it's good. Good. just be in dialogue. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Yeah, it's been fun. Yes. Corey. Yeah. Really, yes. really, really enjoy you. If you want to learn more about Corey Silverberg, visit their website, CoreySilverberg.com or find them on Instagram and Twitter at Corey Silverberg. If you want to tell us about the awkward sex talk that you got as a kid, want to share resources that you've used with your children, or just want to connect with other Foxy listeners, head to Facebook and join our Facebook group at We Are Curious Foxes. Our beautiful website is filled with reading lists, blog posts, and past episodes that can help you indulge your adult curiosity about love, sex, and relationships. Visit us at wearecuriousfoxes.com. To support the show and continue to indulge your curiosity, join us on Patreon at We Are Curious Foxes, where you can find many episodes, podcast extras that couldn't make it to the show, and over 50 videos from educator-led workshops. If you find our episodes interesting, funny, or helpful, please share our podcast with a friend, quickly rate the show, leave a comment, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, or follow us on Spotify or Stitcher. This is only going to take a few seconds of your time, but it's going to have a big impact for us. And let us know that you're listening by sharing a comment, story, or question. You can email us or send us a voice memo to listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. Or you can record a question for the show by calling us at 646-450-9079. This episode is produced by Effie Blue and Jacqueline Misler, with help from Yamur Erkische. Our editor is Nina Pollock, who magically transforms the awkward into awesome every episode. Our intro music is composed by Dev Saha. We are so grateful for their work and we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. (laughs) Full start, full start. Okay. Hold on. Good morning, Alexis. (laughs) Sorry. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.